morning. Are you all well this morning? Awesome. Who was here last week? Or who couldn't be here maybe, but you listened to the live stream later on? I actually had to do that because I wasn't here last week. What a great word from Pastor Craig was, wasn't it? The authority of scripture in our lives and the fact that we can take it all to the bank all the time, 100%. Right? It is all true all the time. Um, this morning, I just want to say, I'm going to have you all just wave at him. My dad is here with his wife, Kathy, from New York, and uh, it's, it's cool to have them. Sometimes I talk about him when I speak, so now you can put a face with the, uh, the name, <laughs> the example. But they're with us. Uh, they've been with us for almost 10 days. They actually leave Tuesday. So I've been playing tour guide in our, my own city, and it's really, we live in a really beautiful place, and sometimes we forget because we get so busy and we get so caught up. And um, so this week has been fun because I've been reminded just of how beautiful it is, how blessed we are. Um, I'm sunburnt because I spent too much time by the water, which doesn't normally happen to me. But um, it's been a good week. And so we've enjoyed having them here. And so we'll enjoy the next couple of days. Pastors Craig and Renee are actually on vacation. They will be back with us uh, this week, though. And um, so we just bless them. I don't hopefully... You know what? Hopefully they're not watching right now. Hopefully they are relaxing and resting, and they'll catch up to us later. So, um, but like I said last week, Pastor Craig did talk about the um, authority of Scripture and how it is 100% true all the time, absolute truth. There's no error. There's no contradictions. It is all truth. Every single word is God-breathed and truth of the Lord. And I know he said this, but I'm just going to reiterate it, that truth is not something that is determined by our feelings, amen, because our feelings lie to us. Our heart is deceitful and wicked above all things, the scripture tells us. So our feelings will lie to us. Culture does not, not define our truth. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord culture is not part of that. Um, social issues and popular opinion do not define truth. Only God defines the truth. So... I think it's funny because when Pastor Craig mentioned this series of Trending Now to me, I said to him, well, nothing like a really light summer series, guys, like, right? Let's get into the authority of scripture. Today, we're going to talk about politics. Who doesn't love a good conversation about politics? <laughs> Not straight politics. We're going to talk about some things, but um, we're going to dig a little deeper this morning, and we're going to be challenged. My prayer is that you be challenged and encouraged this morning as a church, and you've got a quote up there on the screen already that it says, when a church changes their values to match current culture, they're no longer following the Bible, they're following the lost. How many of you know we can't afford to follow culture? We can't afford to follow the lost, because we will end up as lost as they are, if not worse, because we know the truth. I want to give you some background this morning, because I am going into what we know to be kind of a, a touchier topic. And so I want to kind of give you a little bit more of my background. And I know some of you may know some of this already. So just bear with me. I know there's some of you in the room that don't. So as you can see, I am a white female. I'm in my 40s. Like some of this is obvious, right? I live here in San Diego. I've been here for 20 years. I have two kids who you probably know. My son is typically in the sound booth. I think he's actually here on the floor today. My daughter is typically in kid ministry, chasing babies and playing with toddlers. Okay. Um, I have three dogs at home, one cat, and a bunch of chickens that I honestly have nothing to do with because I don't like birds. Okay. <laughs> uh, what you may not know about me and my family, though, is that my husband is from Argentina. He's an immigrant from Argentina. He came here in 1999, or 97, I'm sorry. You may not know that together we've actually been the recipients of racism as a couple. My very racist grandmother told me when I was first married to my husband that he was going to leave me because simply because he was a Hispanic man. And on the flip side, he was told he didn't want to marry a girl like me because I'm white. But on June 18th, 17th, sorry, June 18th is my daughter's birthday. I'm getting confused. June 17th, we celebrated 18 years of marriage. So they were wrong. It's safe to say that they were wrong. Right? Um, our kids, my kids, they're biracial. They really are. You know, there's no way around that. And it's, it's not something I think about often. But these things are all truths of where um, we've been taken as a family and where we even currently sit as a family and within culture. Um, a lot of you know I grew up on the East Coast in upstate New York. 
I grew up with good family values. My parents loved Jesus and raised me to love him and fear him in the most reverence of ways. But I also grew up in a small town that had very, very narrow-minded thinking. And so that's something the Lord had to bring me out of as I've grown with him and as I moved across the country and started to experience the different things and different people in different situations. And I think it's important, especially when we're getting to topics like this, to just know the background of the person because I want you to understand that there's been a little bit of, of life lived and the Lord has really dealt with me in certain things and, um, and, and had to change my heart in different ways. So while we tackle and unpack some heavy topics in the next few weeks as a church family and in our gathering, it's all going to be done from a biblical understanding and a kingdom mindset. Amen? Amen. And truly, if the church doesn't talk about and is not willing to talk about these types of things from a Christian worldview, who is going to do it? Not the world. They're certainly not going to give us the truth. The only place we're going to find truth is here. So we're going to elevate this morning the fact that you and I were citizens of heaven. How do I know that? Because the scripture tells me that. And he tells us that in Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. But we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives, and we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our Savior. He will take our weak mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own, using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. So you and I, we're not from here. We'll never be from here. We are citizens of an eternal kingdom. In other words, this is saying, don't get yourself so wrapped up here in the things of the world. Don't get so entangled with the things around you. Because in due time, the Lord is saying, I'm going to come. I'm going to return. I'm going to change your mortal bodies. I'm going to change everything around you. So don't get so consumed with what is happening around you. There's a quote by Oliver Wendell Holmes, and maybe some of you have heard it. It says, some people are so heavenly minded that they are no earthly good. And the flip side of that is that some are so earthly minded that they're no heavenly good either. We need to have balance. We need to have both. We need to live in this tension, the tension of those two worlds, of the fact that we're not citizens. We don't belong here. We're passing through, but the Lord has a purpose and a plan in our passing through. And we can't pretend that the world we live in is imaginary. We can't just discount the things that we see and the things that we hear. We need to be sharing the gospel. We need to be proclaiming the truth at every turn and living in our present at the same time. And we have to understand that we carry a heavenly responsibility as citizens of heaven that are just passing through. Paul references in 1 Corinthians, and I love, this is one of my favorite passages, and I chose to uh, give it to you in the message version this morning. It's 1 Corinthians 9, verses 19 through 23. It says, even though I'm free of the demand and expectations of everyone, I have voluntarily become a servant to any and all in order to reach a wide range of people, religious, non-religious, meticulous moralist, loose living immoralist, the defeated, the demoralized, whoever. I didn't take on their way of life. I kept my bearings in Christ, but I entered their world and tried to experience things from their point of view. I've become just about every sort of servant there is in my attempts to lead those I meet into the God saved life. I did all this because of the message. I didn't just want to talk about it. I wanted to be in on it. Amen. If you read that in another version, it says, I become all things to all people that I might win some. Paul didn't engage in worldly behavior. He said, no, I kept my bearings in Christ. I knew who I was. I know I'm a citizen of heaven, so I behave like one. But my purpose on the earth is that I have compassion and empathy for the people that I encounter and the people that I meet that are from different walks of life that maybe don't know Jesus yet, right? But your encounter with them could change the yet to the now. Right? As followers of Jesus, we get to bring a different perspective and a different type of behavior, even in the midst of hard topics. And in the middle of all the craziness we see, we have a responsibility to carry peace. How do we carry peace? Well, the Holy Spirit lives in us, Jesus lives in us, and he is peace. Therefore, we don't have to work for it very hard. It is who we are because we carry all the things 
that the Father has given us. We carry who he is. Matthew 5, 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. I think of it kind of like parents. You'll, you'll know what I mean. When your kids are little and you hire the babysitter to come for a few hours so you can just try and go to dinner or something. And the poor babysitter, I've been the poor babysitter plenty of times when I was younger. And it's not fun. So pray for your babysitters when you leave your children with them. <laughs> um, no, the, the kids are little and they're like, oh, mom and dad just walked out. We're going to raise havoc. We're going to raise havoc. And the poor babysitter is running from one end of your house to the other end of your house trying to get little Johnny and little Susie and whoever they are and corral them. And, but it's 8 o'clock and you're supposed to be in bed at 7.45 and why are you not? And they won't listen because p- <laughs> havoc is broken out in the house and they don't know how to keep. She's trying to keep the peace. And a lot of times as we believers, us as believers, we're doing that in our world. We're running around trying to grab people, trying to grab uh, situations to make them well again. And we are trying to keep peace instead of making peace. Making peace as a peacemaker is who you are. It is who I am. We don't run around frantic in the world. We create peace wherever we go. Every step we take into a situation that looks ugly, every uh, word we get to speak into a conversation, we bring peace with us because we carry the peace of our Father. And if, if any of you are, we're all paying attention. We all know the world we're living in. And it's, we have some really uncertain times happening. We really do. In the last bit in our nation, we've seen what we'll call this morning, we'll refer to as a political spirit that has really risen up. Um, and there's unrest. There's unrest in our world. And the spirit has really come in and it has sought to really divide and conquer us. And even within the church. Even within the church, if we're honest. I don't know that I've seen this much discord. I've grown up in the church, and I've been a Christian for about 30 years. And I don't know that I've ever seen this much discord and ugly behavior. Not only from the world, but sometimes from us. Rise up as certain topics and things have come up. It's like the enemy is working this overtime. Because he knows. He knows his, first of all, he knows his time is short. So he's working hard, right? But at the same time... It's like he's coming in to attempt to unravel us, unravel our faith, unravel the things that we called concrete and certain in our lives, like the truth of scripture, for example. He's trying to deconstruct who we are as people. And he knows that if he can unravel us enough, there's a chance he can pull our integrity from us too as the church and as people of God. He'll work to take away our zeal. He'll work to take away our passion for the things of God. By throwing that chaos, that moment, that subject across our way. And you know what? In the moment that we react poorly, we've lost our integrity with the person, with the situation, with whatever it is. So this morning, we're going to talk a little bit about patriotism. And we're going to talk about nationalism. We're going to talk about the differences. Briefly, we're going to talk about the differences of those two words. And what they mean. How do we live as believers and not be consumed by this political spirit in our culture and in the days that we live in? One thing I do know, and I'll start with this. I do know this for sure. Jesus was not a Democrat and he was not a Republican. He was the son of God and he lived for an eternal kingdom. That's it. He didn't have a political agenda. He was just who he was on the earth. So we're gonna, I'm just going to briefly go through, um, I'm going to read from, actually to you the definitions of patriotism and nationalism from Christianity Today. I just pulled these up, and this is how they described these two things. So patriotism, we'll start there. According to Christianity Today, this is the definition. Patriotism is a love of country. It is different from nationalism, which is an argument about how to define our country. Christians should recognize that patriotism is good because all of God's creation is good. And patriotism helps us appreciate our particular place in it. Our affection and loyalty to a specific part of God's creation helps us to do the good work of cultivating and improving the part we happen to live in. And as Christians, we can and should love the United States, which also means working to improve our country by holding it up for critique and working for justice when it errs. Okay? Nationalism. This is the definition according to Christianity today. 
It says, most scholars agree that nationalism starts with the belief that humanity is divisible into mutually distinct, internally coherent cultural groups defined by shared traits like language, religion, ethnic ethnicity, or culture. From there, scholars say nationalists believe that these groups should each have their own governments, that governments should promote and protect a nation's cultural identity, and that sovereign national groups provide meaning and purpose for human beings. So I'm just going to break this down really quickly. So patriotism is a love and honor for country. It seeks to unite and stand together. It's not afraid to fix a problem when there's a problem. We can be wrong, but we can fix it. That's OK. That's OK. National, nationalism, though, at its core, its true core, is dividing. And the idea behind nationalism is that it would segregate and drive a wedge between people. Right? It says, oh, well, you're, you feel this way on this topic, so you're going to go over here. And while I feel this way, so I'm going to stand over here. We're going to divide instead of unify. We're going to divide instead of unify. And didn't we read about that in scripture? I don't have it pulled up this morning. But brother against brother, father against son. How good would be called evil and evil would be called good. It may look on the outside like it's a good idea for us to just hang out with the same-minded people or the same belief you know, same people that, that share a belief. But it's not. Isn't it like the enemy to manipulate, to twist, to attempt to divide the body of Christ? He's such a jerk, guys. Such a jerk. Patriotism, although it is honoring and protective at its core, it should always come with humility, honor to its leadership. And I'm... And honestly, that means whether we agree or not. It is honoring and it is humble, even if we don't agree. Sometimes, sometimes, we want to be able to, and this is just my, the way my brain thinks is thrown out there. Sometimes we want to be able to flip a table in the name of Jesus and have no responsibility for it whatsoever. Sometimes we just want to go knock something off and say, but I love Jesus. There it is. Wash my hands. I know nobody in this room has ever behaved like that. Me neither. But if that's you or if that's me, if that's just something that you're like, oh, maybe, you know what? There's a possibility that that political spirit, that that national, nationalist way of doing things has somehow crept its way in. And what we have to do is, is that spirit is spurring on this behavior in our nation, our cities, and in our families. And we can no longer stand for it. As the church, we can't. The political spirit is not humble. It doesn't look for the best interest of others. It only seeks to be right. If we can't be proven wrong, if we can't stand to be wrong, it's time to, to do a heart check. We all want to be part of a cause. I think it's human nature to want to stand for something, to want to be able to fight for something, to see it to the other side and see liberation and freedom and all the things Right, it's it's our it's in us. Justice is in us, but it's but we want to be part of the, of a cause. We want to be able to stand for the marginalized, to fight for the oppressed, fuck the political systems and leaders and their agendas. But the only cause that we as believers should take on and stand for is the cause of the kingdom, and the only rights we have as believers is to be servant to all and part of a solution. The only cause we have is Jesus. The only cause we have is the work. And things of his kingdom. Because remember, we're citizens of heaven just passing through. So we really only work for one. Peter Marshall said this. May we think of freedom not as a right to do as we please, but the opportunity to do what is right. And I'm going to add to that what is biblically right, not popular opinion or even our own opinion. Did Jesus do those things? Did he stand up for people? Did he, did he stand up for the oppressed and the marginalized? Yes. He absolutely did. He absolutely did. But the scripture tells us that he only did what his father told him to do and only said what his father told him to say. That's the difference. Are we walking this out, leaning into this, to the Holy Spirit, leaning into the Father and saying, is this what you have for me right now? Or are we just spouting off? And Jesus, although the Son of God came to earth, he didn't become a king. We know this. He was born humbly in a stable, and he became a servant, and he surrendered his heavenly rights when he got here. 
And if you and I are truly citizens of the kingdom of God, like scripture tells us that we are, then I do believe it is time for us to surrender our, our causes in humility to our king as he did. And I'm not saying we lay down and die. I'm not saying that the issues and the propositions and all the things that we face and that swirl around us politically, we just lay down and say, well, I'm a citizen of heaven. I'm not fighting this. I'm not doing anything. I'm not going to have a conversation. No, that's not what I'm telling you. <laughs> Please don't hear my heart. Don't uh, not hear my heart this morning. But I think that as believers and as uh, people that carry the Holy Spirit in us, you know, we are called to different places in the world. We're called to different mountains, if you will. If any of you have ever heard of um, Johnny Enlow, he wrote a book about the seven mountains of culture. It's a wave at me if you've heard of it or heard of the idea. Maybe you haven't read the book, but you've, read, you've heard the, the idea. And so in that book, he addresses these seven gateways, these seven mountains, um, where he's, he believes that the Lord places people. We're all created on purpose for a purpose. And so I'm just going to go quickly through what they are, and then I'm going to kind of touch on a couple. Uh, there's seven of them. They're family, religion, education, media, entertainment, business, and government. Seven separate things, seven separate places that in our culture we could potentially be placed on. And maybe you've got, like, your foot on a couple different ones. That's okay. As long as you're where God has placed you, right? So, for example, one of them is family. He says, if you're like a homemaker, right, and I got to be a homemaker for many years, that's the place where God has called you to. Your family is your top priority. Maybe your extended family is part of your top priority. Church family, and maybe God has called upon you to uh, take on, you know, the weekly mom's group or whatever and, and run a Bible study or something like that, right? You're called to that mountain where you're pouring into your family. You're pouring into families, and that's where the Lord has placed you, even if it's just for a season. I had that for a season, right? Um, I work at a school. My mountain right now and for several years has been the mountain of education, right? That's where the Lord has placed me. I've been in education a total of about 12 years from preschool age up to junior high currently. And if you count my youth ministry days, then the age range is even broader and the time is longer. So I've always had my hands in a generation wherever I've been, right? Those, that's a mountain, the place that God has specifically put me on purpose. And I've been put there to have favor there. I've been put there to love on staff and students. I've been put there to pray and speak into the realm of education of our schools and different places, right, and our, our student ministries over the years. And I may not be on the mountain of politics, but of course those topics come to the places where God has put you. And that's okay. That's okay. So when I have a conversation, if something comes up, I'm bringing peace and I'm releasing who I am, and I'm releasing the truth of the Father, no matter where I'm standing, right? So, and I, play, I pray a lot for wisdom. <laughs> so at the same time, though, there are people in our culture, there are people in this world that the Lord has strategically placed on the mountain of government and, and mountain, on the mountain of politics. These men and women have been handpicked by the Father to stand in the gap, receive favor, and guide our nation, our states, and our cities. All on purpose. People that actually have the specific calling to speak into that. You know, um, for example, Pastor, or I'm sorry, Mayor Bill Wells of El Cajon, he's one of those guys. If you've ever heard him talk, if you've ever listened to him, he has his hands right there, but he is a strong, devout Christian. And so he is releasing hope and the goodness of God over the city that he oversees. The Lord obviously has him there on purpose. You know, and it's easy for us to get on our soapbox and say what we know and say what we've learned. And I'm not saying don't be educated by any means. Again, don't hear, don't not hear my heart in this. Be educated. Know your facts. Read your Bible to know your facts better. And if you're able to vote, vote. It's a God-given right in this country. But we have to be better at not allowing this political spirit or agenda to divide us and consume us. Am I saying that the politicians, the, the people that we see in power are all great? No. Is there corruption? Yes. But are there amazing God-fearing people in places also? Yes. Yes. So we can't just look and say, this needs to be removed. This needs no, but there are people here 
And we see good things happening even in this day. Even in the last few months, we have seen good things. We have seen wins for the kingdom. So while there, there will always be corruption, there will always be light. Okay? So, but if we continue to allow this political agenda or spirit to divide us within the church, it's wrong. It's wrong. John 13, 35 says, the world will know we're Christians by our love. Our love for one another, our love for the world around us, even if they don't think like us, even if they don't believe like us. The scripture also says that he draws people in to his loving kindness, through, or into repentance through loving kindness. If we're not being loving and we're not being kind, who are we drawing in? Who is he? He's like, I can't go in there. You just made a mess of me. A friend of mine recently said this, and I just thought it was so great, so I put it in my notes when I was preparing. My friend Ricardo said, if you get better treatment from Chili's than you do from the church, then there's a problem. Sometimes the server at Chili's is a little more pleasant and a little more accommodating than the church is. So this morning, we can kind of do a little turn here. We're going to talk about Daniel for a few moments. How many of you love Daniel? He was such a great guy. He really was. He had a lot going on, and he was a good guy. He was definitely 100% called to the, the mountain, if there was a mountain back in the day, of politics and government. And he was somebody that did it well. So we're just going to go through a summary of who he was for time's sake. For time's sake. Um, and I'm just going to read a little bit. After Nebuchadnezzar, who was the king of Babylon, besieged Jerusalem, he chose noblemen from Israel's royal household who were handsome and showed an aptitude of learning to be trained in the ways of the Babylonians. And after three years of training, they would be put into the king's service. We find that in Daniel chapter 1, and that's verses 1 through 6, that that is talked about. We do know that Daniel was 17. He was a kid. He was as old as my son. And when they took him into captivity, they gave him the name Belteshazzar. I'm probably saying that wrong. Which actually, in the Babylonian kingdom, was the most prestigious idol. Even Daniel as a slave walked in with favor. And he wasn't even yet put in the places God was going to put him. But something about him, something he carried, something that the Lord had placed on him as a believer, was already seen and felt and known, even as he was taken in as a slave. They actually, uh, the king Nebuchadnezzar tried to... Uh, they tried to burn sacrifices and bow to Daniel. And Daniel said, no, I don't want that. Eventually, he would be called upon to interpret dreams for the king as a young man. Because they saw the way he lived and they saw a different connection to a higher power than what they understood. And we can look at Daniel's life and we can say, man, he was such a cool young man. What, what amazing rapport he had with the king and with the, the kingdom there. Man, God really used him. But what we can't, you know, from being taken into slavery and proving himself, eventually he was chosen to be the governor of all of Babylon and over all the wise men of Babylon. And um, we can't jump, though, from his captivity to his prestige because there's a lot of things that happen in between. There's a lot of integrity that he had to prove and that in between. And without acknowledging those things that happen, um, we really can't grasp the fullness of, of Daniel and his life. This is what Daniel said to the Lord after he was called upon to interpret a dream um, for King Nebuchadnezzar. And I don't have this verse on the, on the screens this morning. Uh, Daniel chapter 2, and it's verses 19 through 23. And this is uh, Nebuchadnezzar had come to him and asked him to interpret one of his dreams. I believe it was the first dream. And Daniel said, okay, let me pray about it. And he was woken in the night with a vision, and it's in Daniel, again, chapter 2, verses 19 through 23. It says this, Then the secret was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night, and Daniel blessed the God of heaven. And Daniel answered, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and power belong to him. It is he who changes the times and the seasons. He moves kings and establishes kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and greater knowledge to those who have understanding. It is he who reveals to profound and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness, and the light dwells with him. I thank you and praise you, O God of my fathers, for you have given me wisdom and power, for now you have made it known to me what we requested of you. 
for you have made known to us the solution of the king's matter. David lived, or Daniel lived, as a citizen of heaven. In that passage, it shows us that he knew where his strength and his favor came from. He could have been just like, what a cool gift I have. I'm so great, even, even <laughs> the enemy countries love me. I got favor, I can have whatever I want. They don't make me eat their food. No, but he knew, he knew what rested on him. He knew who he was, and he knew that he was just a citizen passing through. And you don't go from, I think this is kind of fun, you don't go from being the young picky eater because he didn't want to eat the king's food. No, 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 let me, let me do this different. The guy that ends up being miraculously, miraculously saved of a den of, in a den of lions, right? A dream interpreter to ruling the governor of Babylon, eventually, without surrender to a higher power without honor to those God has placed above you, and without carrying peace into every and all situation. And Daniel surrendered to Nebuchadnezzar, but not in a, a lay down and, and die kind of a way, like I spoke of earlier. It was more of a Jesus, what are you asking of me in this day and in this moment kind of way. He died to himself. It probably would have been easier for him to eat the food. Um, he may have wanted to rise up and and fight and, and tell them why he was not going to conform. <laughs> but he didn't. He could have argued all his opinions as to why he wasn't interested. But instead, he found a way to honor the Lord and his earthly king, Nebuchadnezzar. And guess what? We all know the Lord proved better in that situation. He honored the Lord first. He honored the king that was placed in front of him. And the Lord showed up. There's something on the idea of surrender and honor. On the way to the lion's den where he, his friends, were, they were sent there because they wouldn't bow. They wouldn't bow. And so they said, well, all right, you won't pray to me. You won't, you won't do that. I guess you've got to go. And the Bible says Nebuchadnezzar was in anguish when he had to send Daniel because he loved Daniel. He loved him. And it says that the king actually stayed up all night long in silence, just waiting, you know, waiting for, for daybreak. And Daniel could have kicked and screamed all the way there. I might have. I probably would have. But he chose to trust the Lord, even in the face of death. And if I'm Daniel, I'm thinking this is where it ends. Obviously, I'm not coming out of this pit tomorrow morning. But, Lord, I've given you what I can give you. I've honored those you've placed in front of me. I've tried to do this the best that I can. But we, as we all know, Daniel made it out the next morning, and so did his friends. Because Daniel, stood, he stood for his convictions, and he gave honor to one. He didn't bow. The one true God, he knew he, he knew he would save him. He knew he could save him. And in that moment, he trusted him enough to place his trust in the one he knew. And so in our world today, we don't have to worry. It's hard not to, and I get that. It's hard not to have fear. It's hard not to wonder sometimes what tomorrow is going to look like in culture and politics and all of it. But we really don't need to get ourselves all into a, a fuss over it. Because God knows what he's doing. He knew what he was doing in the days of Daniel. And he knows what he's doing today. He doesn't make a mistake. He's never made a mistake. We need to learn and we need to be informed. But better than that, we need to love. And we need to carry peace to the people around us. Because there are people in the world that are in a tizzy, that are fearful, that are just very unsettled, that don't know the Lord. And why shouldn't we be the, the carriers of peace that come into their situation and say, hey, I know. I understand. I'm seeing the same things you're seeing. But I know a guy who can change everything. I know somebody that you can place your trust in. And he's good. And he's proved it over and over and over again. Daniel didn't fight for his rights against Nebuchadnezzar. Instead, he stood for his convictions. It's important to stand for our convictions. He could have raised his voice in protest, but instead he kneeled in prayer. Daniel could have created havoc in the midst of chaos, but instead he carried a peace that only heaven can give. And he carried an authority because peace and authority resided in him. And he knew who he was, and he knew whose son he was, and he knew what he carried, and he knew what he could release into the kingdom of Babylon, and he did it. And this morning, I just want to remind us, guys, like, that's us. We're a modern-day Daniel. In a lot of ways. We love Jesus, right? 
love Jesus. I know. We're, it's been kind of a quiet, a quiet message. That's okay. But I want to remind you this morning that as believers, you, like Daniel, you carry a holy surrender. You have the ability inside of you to surrender to one and to do it well. Our king, our king, King Jesus, he's our example in this. We can do that because he gave everything for us. He surrendered even to, to the death of the cross, right? So we can surrender. Philippians 2, 7 and 8, it says, Rather he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus was our humble king. He laid his life down in humility. He surrendered to the will of the Father and then laid himself down in humility. I believe we have to walk in humility in the days ahead, in its world, in our culture. And I believe it is vital that we surrender to what the Lord is asking of us as individuals and as a church. We need to be in a place where we lean so heavily into his chest and lean our ears so heavily to his voice that we're only moving with him that we're only speaking what he is asking us to speak. And guys, I'm going to say this. Don't, don't fight to stay on a mountain that you're not called to be on. Stay on your mountain well. Stay in your lane well. That's another way to say it. If the Lord places somebody in front of you and that conversation, that thing comes up, that's fine. Do it well. Do it well. Romans 3, 13, 1. Oh, I'm sorry. Honor, honor is another thing we have to carry in these days. It's not easy sometimes because we see things and we see, we see problems and we go, hmm. But Romans 13, 1 says this, let every person be subject to the government, governing authorities for there is no authority except from God and those that exist have been instituted by God. And just like in Daniel's day, God has not made a mistake of who is where in our government. We can look at it and say, I see lots of mistakes. But God has not made a mistake. God will not be shaken by the days ahead. He's not been shaken by the ones that have already passed us. And I will say this, honor and pray for our officials on all levels. On all levels. If we're not praying for them, we certainly shouldn't be complaining about them. And we're not just praying that they be removed, because that's an easy prayer to prayer when we don't agree. And we want things our way. We pray that they would have an encounter with the love of the Father like they have never, ever had in their life. Because what we need is not necessarily a change of leadership. We need a change of heart, and we need transformation of a nation. So we need transformation of the hearts of the people that have been placed in those places. Because you know what? We can pray them out. But then what if they never meet Jesus? Then we're not doing our full job. Because our job as the body of Christ is to lead people to him. And you carry a peace and authority because Jesus is peace and he is heavenly authority and he resides in you the same way he resides in me. Again, we're peacemakers. Every place we go, everything we touch has the ability to just Havoc that's happening, peace be still in Jesus' name. When you walk into a, a heated discussion, you have the authority and you carry an authority that it's like my footsteps here, the havoc stops now in Jesus' name. Release the peace of the Father into those situations and carry your peace. If you ever go into a conversation, and I've done this, and you haven't prayed and put some prayer behind it, just stop. Just don't talk about it. Because anything coded in prayer goes so much farther than something that we can just spout off in a moment. We don't need to change people's minds. Their hearts need to be changed. I've never done any good to anybody spouting off my own opinions and my agendas. But when I yield to the Holy Spirit and his leading and his agenda, that's when you see good fruit come forth for the glory and honor of the kingdom of God, not my own kingdom. Not the things I want to see, not my own opinion, not what I think needs to happen, but what God thinks and knows it needs to happen. 1 Corinthians 16, 24, again in the message, it says this, keep your eyes open. Hold tight to your convictions. 
Give it all you've got. Be resolute and love without stopping. Do whatever you're called to do in the realm of the mountain God has placed you on. Inform yourself, seek wisdom, and love people well. Chris Vallotton from Bethel says this, the invisible kingdom inside you ultimately becomes the visible kingdom around you. So I'm asking you today, what is the invisible kingdom that's inside you? Has it become angry? Has it become bitter? Has it become condescending when you when the, the idea or the subject of politics comes up or leadership comes up or who, what we're doing, if you get that rise up in your spirit, that's not Jesus. The invisible kingdom in us should be love, joy, peace, gentleness, self-control. Those are the fruits of the spirit. Those are the things that we want as that invisible kingdom to rise up and spew out of us when something comes up that we maybe don't agree with. Philippians 1.27, above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. Then whether I come and see you again or only hear about you, I will know that you are standing together with one spirit and one purpose, fighting together for the faith, which is the good news. We fight for the faith. We're not fighting against each other. Oswald Chambers said this, and he was, it's, it's profound. My goal is God himself, not joy nor peace, nor even blessing, but himself, my God. Am I measuring my life by this standard or something else? Is what we're really after him, is what we're really after his kingdom and making him known. Because we can get caught up in the things of the world. We can get up, caught up in the agendas and the different situations and the different conversations. But if my goal stops being him, if my goal stops being um, broadening his kingdom, then I, I, I'm doing such a disservice to my king. Our only goal is him, and our only cause is his kingdom. And I believe we're in a day where we, we will do what the Father asks us to do as Christians. And nothing more and nothing less. And sometimes it's going to look different. Day to day it could look different depending on what's placed in front of us, what topics, what things are happening in our world. But it's time to be better and love better. It's time to take authority over this political spirit that has run rampant for, for far too long as far as I'm concerned. And come back to Jesus and him crucified. I believe Paul has said, I desire to have nothing else among you but Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's it. I don't have to agree with you 100%. I don't even have to like you. The only thing I have to know is that Jesus died for me and you. And because he died for you too, you're worth my time. You're worth my conversation. You're worth my love and you're worth my acceptance. We need to live surrendered, give honor, and carry peace. But the most important thing we do is we pray. We pray. Ryan, are you, are you here? Can you come up and just play a little guitar behind me, please, as we close? But the most important thing that we do is, is we pray. In Second Chronicles, and this is a very familiar passage that you probably quote with me. Um, but it might be in the message. You might not know it word for word. <laughs> I can't remember which one I did. But Second Chronicles 7, and it's verses 14 and 15. Then if my people will humble themselves and pray and search for me and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear them from heaven and forgive their sins and heal their land. I will listen wide awake to every prayer made in this place. He listens to every prayer made from a place of humility and made from a place of repentance. We have to understand that we have had moments and places where friends we have been wrong, and we have to recognize that as believers, as children of God. And so this morning, as we close, we are going to pray because that's the best thing we can do, and we are going to repent, and we're going to ask the Father to kind of um, purify our hearts a little bit and the subject of politics and the subject of leaders that we um, have been placed under. 
even if it's just for a season. And so I'm going to ask you all to just stand where you are. Close your eyes. You can, however you kind of see fit to pray. I'm going to ask um, my friend Esmeralda to come. And this is just a way, we, we spoke earlier about nationalism and how it just seeks to divide. It seeks to take us off course from one another. And so I've asked her to come, and we're going to do bilingual prayer this morning. And this is just a way to, um, to show unity. And um, she's also a veteran. This is just a way to bring us all like full circle, like, hey, we are one. We are one. So I'm going to ask her to start off and pray for our nation. And please, church, feel free to pray out as you, you feel to pray out this morning. And we'll do this, and then I'll pray, and we'll close. So. Padre nuestro, el creador de los cielos y la tierra. Tú, Señor, que nos has dado un mundo lleno de diferentes personas, culturas, pero todos lloramos igual, todos sangramos igual. Pero tú, Señor, nos dices que somos tus hijos. Y hoy, Señor, te pido que nos des una sabiduría de protección hacia uno y al otro. Que, comen, que, que nosotros podamos ver lo que tú ves de tus ojos, Señor. De lo que tú sientes, podemos ver ese amor que tienes a, a esa otra persona. Esa persona que sea del otro lado del mundo o que sea enfrente de nosotros. Te pido que nos llenes de unidad, nos llenes de paz y salvación sobre todos nosotros, Señor. Todas las naciones, Señor. Y te pido, Señor, que hacia cada momento que comenzamos a sentir esa humildad hacia ti, Señor. Que, que en esos momentos que cuando comenzamos a, a oír tu voz, Señor. Ayúdanos a iluminar tu luz. Y no ver a las cosas de, de lo político, Señor. Te pido unas bendiciones grandes hacia todos nosotros. Hacia nuestro mundo, Señor. Y te pedimos gracias por lo que siempre has hecho, que es amarnos. Gracias por tu amor, Señor. Gracias. I'm going to ask you to just lift your hands as we close out in prayer this morning. Father, we thank you for the United States. Father, we thank you for our leadership, God, on all levels, those that you have placed above us in this day. Father, we pray for those that don't know you this morning, and we pray, God, for supernatural encounters with your presence, God, to overtake them. Lord, where there is corruption, God, we just pray right living in Jesus' name. That the things that are done in secret, God, would be revealed, but not just to be spewed out into the light, God, but to be dealt with and handled in, in a loving, corrective way. Father, we just come together as the body this morning, and we, we repent for the, the hate speech that we've spewed ourselves, God. We repent, Lord, for the ways that we've not measured up and not come into alignment with your heart on this subject, God, and for people. Father, we humble ourselves under your hand this morning, and we say, make us better. We ask, God, that you would make us more sensitive to your spirit, God, that we would only walk with you in these days. Father, that you would work your divine miracles through us and in us, God, that our hearts would be changed. Father, change us. 
change us, God, as we've fallen so short. Jesus, we're sorry. As a church, we are sorry. Lord, make us better. Lord, heal our hearts and make us better. Help us to love better. Help us to listen better. Father, help us to know deep in the core of who we are, God, that those that we encounter were made in your image just like us. They just may not know it yet. So, Father, today over this place, I just release your love. I release your peace, God, as we are our people that carry peace. Lord, I just release your peace over every single person that is here. And we say, have your way. We say, have your way, God, in us in the days to come. And, Lord, may we move with you. May we speak only with you, God, the things that you tell us. And may we love well. In Jesus' name, amen.